The concept of a persona is an intriguing one to say the least. Being able to use your own willpower to manifest a powerful being to overcome the trials ahead in life is just awesome. It's the type of thing that gets me excited just to think about. Even while I write this script, the fact that different characters can have a persona based on the same god or demon, yet they look so different from one another is such an amazing thing too. The individuality creates such a fantastic added layer to what a persona is, both for how they tie into the game's plot or to each of the characters' personal journeys. I just can't help but feel the need to gush about my favorite ones throughout the series. This won't be a like top 10 kind of video because, well, I don't think I could order all of them outside of like maybe the top two. I'd rather just provide a general list of my favorite ones that we've seen throughout Persona. There's no real criteria for this either. I could like a Persona because of how it looks, how it ties into a character's growth, its animations, almost anything really. And just to clarify, when I say personas, I mean the unique persona that is linked to a specific character, not just any demon in the Megami Tensei franchise. For an example of why I'm making this distinction, here's Yamato Takeru in Persona 4, and here's Yamato Takeru in SMT4. Yeah, pretty big difference, ain't it? Don't worry, I'll talk about my favorite demons another time. As a heads up though, there may be spoilers for each individual game while talking about the personas, since a good number of my favorites are the ultimate personas and you get them pretty late into the game. So there's your spoiler warning now. Feel free to skip around to whichever games you've already seen. With that out of the way, let's get started. When it comes to the first Persona game, it can seem a little tricky to find some favorites. Unlike the modern entries, we don't have the luxury of seeing the personas in a full 3D space. And some are just normal demons that lack any distinguishing features to make them feel specific to the characters. Look no further than Reiji's ultimate persona, Mott. It's the same as any other Mott in the franchise. Despite that though, Persona 1 features a good number of my favorites. Let's start with Brown's initial persona, Nevin. Yeah, apparently it's pronounced Nevin. I was not ready for that. Nevin is part of a trio of goddesses in Irish mythology known as the Morrigan. The Morrigan is the goddess of war, death, and fate, with Nevin in particular representing pandemonium during battle. This duo best represents how Brown starts off in the story, considering how Brown's timid nature can cause him to panic. Despite this, Brown is able to grow more confident and stronger as a person as the events of Persona 1 unfold. The design is another favorite of mine as well. The wings combined with the armor just look so cool to me and I really love Nevin's attack animations as well, particularly the pose she goes into while using Heavenly Cyclone. To me, it looks like the winds wreaking havoc on the enemies are keeping Nevin afloat, and that added flair leads to it being a personal favorite animation in the series for me. And we haven't even made the jump to 3D yet. I know Personas are usually always floating to begin with, but let a guy dream. But that's enough for Brown. Let's move on to another character. At the beginning of Persona 1, we're introduced to Nanjo's butler, Yamaoka. With Nanjo's parents commonly away on business, Yamaoka is tasked with taking care of the young heir. Despite only being his butler, Nanjo cares a great deal for Yamaoka, as he's the only person in his life who gives him the time and affection he deserves. When zombies attack, Yamaoka is killed trying to protect some civilians. In his dying words, he tells Nanjo to work hard and to become the number one man in Japan, a feat Yamaoka always knew Nanjo could accomplish. Later on, Yamaoka makes a return as Nanjo's guardian angel, a persona only he could have. I absolutely love this idea. Caring for someone so much that even in death, you're able to live on in their heart and protect them. This is the only time in the series this has happened, and it makes it all the more special. The item used to fuse Yamaoka is the amber glasses. When I played the game, I always had a thought in the back of my mind that those were actually just Yamaoka's glasses. And in the manga, you can see Nanjo pick them up himself and hold on to them. The design is pretty awesome too. It adds enough to make Yamaoka look capable of fighting, but he's still recognizable as the same man who believed in Nanjo more than anyone else. With this form, he'll be able to keep watch of Nanjo's journey, just as he always had. And finally for Persona 1, we have not only my favorite persona in the game, but my favorite persona in the franchise. Naoya's ultimate persona, Amun-Ra. I love Egyptian mythology. Even outside of Megami Tensei, I've always been fascinated by Egyptian folklore, gods, and especially the artistry. And Amun-Ra just embodies all the stylistic elements I adore. 
He also happens to wield what I believe is a crook with a crescent moon on the end as his weapon of choice. It reminds me a lot of Sly Cooper's cane, which is my personal favorite weapon in video games. I can't imagine a cooler looking Persona or even a Megami Tensei demon than Amon Ra, and would love to see him make a return in later titles. I really wish that the Persona 1 and Persona 2 Personas could have been a part of the Persona 5 Legacy DLC. It would have been so cool to see them all in 3D. Hope that dream can come true someday. Now, it's no secret that the Persona 2 duology are my favorite games in the series. My profile kinda gives it away, and I have quite a number of Personas from these games that I really love. To begin with Innocent Sin, we have Vulcanus, which is Tatia's initial Persona. And I'm also gonna lump in June's ultimate Persona Kronos into this part, because I can't fully explain why I love them both without the other. When Tatsuya and Jun were kids, they were very close with one another. As a display of friendship, Jun gave Tatsuya his Zippo lighter as a gift, and Tatsuya gave Jun his own silver wristwatch. These items mean a lot to the two boys. The bond they shared together throughout their childhood, as tragic as it may have ended, was very important to them. The bond these two shared shaped the form that their other selves would then take. It's even more special that Jun awakens to Kronos only after reuniting with Tatsuya in the group. After returning to the people who mean most to him and fighting alongside them, Jun was able to remember the bonds most important to him. There will never be another future Vulcanist that looks like Tatsuya's, and there will never be a... Okay, if there was a Kronos that looked very close to this one, I mean, yeah, Kronos is the personification of time, having a clock for a face isn't revolutionary, but I still love him anyways. Next, we've got Tatsuya's ultimate persona, Apollo. First off, the mask. I can't get enough of the design. The way the edges can look like rising flames is such a majestic detail. I love the red suit, the bejeweled gloves, the black trailing down the arms, and especially the epaulets on the shoulders. On top of that, Apollo looks so damn cool in official art and in the openings, man. God. Not to mention his signature move, Nova Kaiser, where he stops time and engulfs his enemy in a beautiful explosion. It is hands down my favorite skill in the series. He's definitely my second favorite Persona in the franchise for sure. Only to the one discussed in the Persona 1 section. Let's move on to Eternal Punishment. Now, this game has a lot of Persona I really like, but I didn't want the video to be longer than it already is, so some missed the cut. The first one up to bat will be Ulala's Callisto. Callisto was a nymph who served under the goddess Artemis. Much like Ulala, Callisto had a very depressing track record with her life. After being deceived by Zeus, who disguised himself as Artemis, Callisto then became pregnant with Zeus's child. She was swiftly cast away once Artemis found out. After giving birth to Zeus's child, Zeus's wife Hera turned Callisto into a bear. This nearly caused Callisto's son to accidentally kill his own mother while hunting. But just in the nick of time, she became a constellation, Ursa Major. Ulala, much like her other self, has a history of being swindled by other men. Despite her innocent desire for affection, she's often given the short end of the stick. The design of Callisto seems to reflect the… torture in a lot of ways. I wonder if her supposed lack in feminine charm has had an impact on Callisto's creation or treatment. A sleek red coat with some tearing at the bottom, a tied up body with metal tips at the end, and a high heel piercing through the metal faceplate, causing cracks to form. It's something to say the least but I can't help but love it for how unique it is. And finally, we have Artemis, Maya's ultimate persona. Another one that looks fantastic in official art and videos. I love the reflective mirror surfaces all around the body. Artemis has such a shine to it both literally and figuratively that it makes it a standout persona in the series. I love its posing, animations, and attacks as well. It really feels like an ultimate, higher tier kind of persona. Absolutely love how it's the centerpiece for Grand Cross. Now, before we move on to the modern Persona entries, I do want to give an honorable mention to the trio of rumor Personas, Tatsuno Shinsuo, Maihime Amano, and Junosuke Kuroda. I particularly love these Personas for their creation, how Nerolithotep created them to mess with Tatsuya, and how the protagonists are actually able to summon these legendary beings to aid them in their battles. 
The reason they don't get a longer section is because getting Junosuke Kuroda is a bit of a hassle because of the way he must be summoned, so I'm kinda lacking in footage on that one, but yeah, I think these guys are great, particularly for their origins above all else. Moving on to the modern titles in the franchise, the jump to 3D allowed for the designs of the personas to be better appreciated with full body viewings, allowing the hard work put in by the designers and the developers to display these beautiful creatures in all of their grand splendor. This especially holds true for the attack animations, as now we have more angles to admire the dynamic actions and poses the personas perform. Differences such as Orpheus strumming his harp for magic, but then bashing a shadow over the head for physical skills, is a detail that serves to enhance the immersion and experience of combat. But this isn't about Orpheus, but rather, it's about Thanatos. He's on a lot of Persona 3's box arts and official art for a reason, and it's not just for plot relevance. The Harbinger of Death carrying two swords and eight coffins chained around him, coupled with a sick headguard and amazing power just exudes a legendary aura. Watching the coffins open up as he casts magic, or the quick and powerful slashes for physical attacks, these put Thanatos' legendary might on full display. I can't get enough of this guy. Considering how he looked back in Persona 1, it's quite the glow up. For the next entry, we have Fuka's starting persona, Lucia. It's pretty rare to see characters interact directly with their persona. Sure, in the earlier games, characters could sense how their persona feels, but it wasn't until the latest entry where characters could, for example, ride their persona like a bike or pilot them as a UFO. But Fuka was the first one to, at the very least, protect herself within her persona. While Lucia isn't suited for combat, she has been seen to at least provide Fuka with some form of defense, as Fuka is protected by the glass eye. The lore behind Lucia is pretty amazing too. Saint Lucia, or Saint Lucy, was a young woman who dedicated her life to Christ, to the point where she refused to marry in order to protect her purity. When her no longer fiancé learned of this, he reported her to the governor, and for her devotion to her beliefs, her punishment was to be defilement at a brothel. As the guards arrived to take Lucy away, she entered a stance of prayer in hopes of salvation. Try as they might, the guards were unable to move Lucy from her spot. They tried to drag her, cut her, and even set her on fire, but nonetheless, Lucy remained with the power of divine intervention. Eventually, she died after a sword pierced through her neck. You can see some of her wounds carried into Lucia's design, with the bandaged eyes and throat along with a charred body. The bandaged eyes, while the lower half of the body is a glass eye, serve as a parallel to the title Lucia holds as the patron saint of the blind, as although she lost her eyes, God bestowed upon her new eyes of pure light. Lucia is the perfect persona to fit the role of a clairvoyant scanner. It'd be cool to see a character sort of wear a persona again. Maybe it could be used as battle armor for a boxer that boosts the user's native strength. I'd love to see what Atlas could do with that. Lastly, my favorites from Persona 3 are Aegis's personas, Palladian and Athena. I love these two for a lot of reasons but the most important one is how they tie into Aegis and her own journey throughout Persona 3. Aegis is an anti-shadow weapon created to wield a persona and to protect humanity from shadows. For most of the game, Aegis views herself as no more than a weapon incapable of feeling emotion or being human. Her starting persona, Palladian, is a statue created in the image of Athena, the Greek goddess of wisdom and war. The statue was viewed as a symbol of safety and was depended on by many. At the end of the day, however, it was just a hollow statue, a shell designed in the shape of a living being. After failing to defeat Ryoji, Aegis laments over her inability to perform her purpose. If she cannot complete what she was created to do as a machine, then what's the point of being around? Why do her friends continue to struggle when there's no hope for victory? She comes to the conclusion that because she isn't alive, she'll never understand why her friends continue to struggle. With the guidance from the rest of Seas, Aegis learns that she's the one who has to find purpose in her life. It's not about what she was created for, but what her heart deems is important. Her newfound resolution allows Palladian to evolve into Athena, going from a mere statue to the legend within. The character to persona symbolism doesn't get any better for me than this. But Aegis' character arc doesn't end here. As Mitsuru said, to truly live and grow as a person, Aegis will need to make changes, just as she has been since joining the team. It's a continuous process, not a single leap forward. Palladian and Athena are two wonderfully designed and executed personas, pairing up perfectly to reinforce Aegis' quest for her answer to life.
Well done, Atlas. I've played Persona 4 a lot. I've probably spent more hours on Persona 4 than the rest of the games in the series combined at this point. And I really can't say enough just how much I love Izanagi. The country maker himself, Izanagi's suave shape, sleek jacket, and the mask guard really convey a sense of power and authority. It's such a beautiful sight to see Izanagi attack. Hell, even just his movement looks completely rad. You can really tell by the full motions that he's really giving his all behind every swing and every vigorous pose. I especially have to give props to Ultimax and BB Tag. They really make Izanagi look even more awesome. And by extension, I have to say I really love Izanagi no Okami's design as well. In Persona 4, all the party member personas retain the same basic design as they evolve. They just mostly get a new coat of paint. Maybe a new weapon added or something extra. But at the end of the day, they're all practically the same thing. Izanagi no Okami isn't all too different from the original form, with some changes such as a new color scheme, an upgraded weapon, a new helmet, and some more that sells that this is the peak, the ultimate form. Magatsu Izanagi also gets props for the twisted and chaotic design scheme. But I have to say just one thing. One thing that is always on my mind when I look at Izanagi. The zipper. I think about it every day. I, I just have so many questions. Is it a stylistic choice? Does it have functional purpose? Does Izanagi have a- Let's talk a bit about Yukiko's Konohana Sakuya. This is elegance, beauty, and flair given form. The flower shields are just so gorgeous. Whenever she performs an action or twirls, it's always just so stylish and refined. There's an air of confidence to her movements, which translates especially well to Ultimax's art style. When it comes to how Persona's look in Ultimax, Konohana Salkia easily steals the show with its calculated yet dazzling animations. I'd also like to give a shout out to Sumeo Okami. The added sword, beautiful golden look, and long flowing hair keep everything I like while making it all shine. I prefer the original for the flowery design, but this one definitely isn't far behind. Alright, all that's left to do now is cover my favorite personas for Persona 5. So, um... You see how short this is compared to the other parts? To be honest, I really don't have many I'm super fond of. A majority of the Persona designs are only just okay to me. For the party member Personas, there's usually a trend where there's the original form, the second form that looks radically different, kind of experimental, and then the ultimate form resembles the initial design but looks, well, newer. This isn't a trend they all share, but it's a fairly common link. So if I'm not crazy about the initial design, then I won't be very crazy about the final one. And to be honest, most of the middle evolutions look kind of meh to me anyways. Like, I'm not fond of Satan Taisei, and a knot just looks kind of wonky, like it could fall over at any time. But if I had to give the spotlight to a Persona line, it'd be Haru's Milady, Astarte, and Lucy. This may be out of nowhere, but I really enjoy the concept of masquerade balls, where people would host these events where you'd have guests wearing these large dresses and decorative masks. Yet underneath that dress for Milady, you have this crazy violent artillery which still looks so magnificent. A balance of elegance and effectiveness in combat, completing what I love so much about Konohana Sakuya, but in a new way. Astarte gains bonus points for being a figure of Egyptian mythology, as well as the beautifully colored skull. And then there's Lucy, and boy do I love Lucy. Bringing back the mask handle but making it shades, with a nice coat on top of the new dress combined with a scarf. A more modern look than most other personas, and one that suits it well. For a game where I'm not that fond of most Persona designs, Haru really scored big on her lineup. Fantastic job. That's it for the video. Thank you all so much for sticking around for however many minutes of me just gushing about all sorts of Personas. This is like one of the more freeform videos I could possibly make, and it felt really good to make something like this. Feels like I got a breath of fresh air after making this video. I'd love to hear about some of your favorite Personas and why you like them so much. Leave a comment, it'd be great to read what y'all think. Well, that's all I got for today, but I do have just one more thing to leave y'all with. Keep going, Senpai! Go to town, Senpai! It's a promise, partner! I'll show you our strength!